Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the conference on writing the Holodomor, the social and cultural history of collectivization and uh, famine in Soviet Ukraine. This conference is organized by Holodomor Research and Education Consortium and Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Um, so thank you for uh, for joining this uh, this panel. The title of the panel is uh, "New Oral and Visual Sources on Collectivization and Holodomor." Uh, my name is Oksana Venik, and I'm a research associate at the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium um, and the, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Um, we will listen to four presentations uh, uh, today, and uh, presenters will speak uh, both uh, English and Ukrainian. If you uh, need uh, to access uh, translation, please uh, press the um, um, globe shape button. Um, and um, translation uh, from Ukraine to English and English to Ukraine. So our first uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Natalia uh, Kuzova. І тема її доповіді uh, є допитання щодо виготовлення збору та аналізу свідчень та спогадів на півдні України, на прикладі Херсонської області у 1932-33 році, регіон Степ, Дніпропетровська та Одеська області. Наталя Кузова є кандидатом історичних наук, доцентом, завідочкою кафедри історії, археології та методики викладання Херсонського державного університету. Вона була однією з упорядників Національної книги пам'яті жертв Голодомору 1932-33 років в Україні, в Херсонська область, а також книги «Херсонщина. Голодомор. 1932-33 роки. Збірник документів». Сферами, основними сферами її інтересів є регіональна історія, генеологія, історія України 20-го століття та архівістика. Прошу, пані Наталя. Вітаю учасників конференції. Дякую, пані Оксана, за презентацію моєї доповіді. Передусім я хотіла зазначити, що усна історія – це важливий крок до людиноцентризму в історичній науці. Адже окреме людське життя та смерть варте не меншої уваги, ніж життя та смерть мільйонів. І сьогодні усна історія – це перспективний напрям історичних досліджень. Однак ми відчуваємо брак досліджень, щоб давали відповідь на питання, яким чином можна досліджувати історію за допомогою джерел саме усної історії. Брак досліджень, присвячених аналізу самих усно-історичних джерел – що здебільшого використовується дослідниками як ілюстративний матеріал. Це призводить до того, що одиничні факти подекуди беруться за масові, або навпаки масові явища, відображені в спогадах, подаються як унікальні. Дослідники відчувають складнощі, проводячи верифікацію джерела, часто не володіють подібною методикою. Також не вистачає досліджень у царині історії, устної історії Голодомору. Методики збору свідчень учасників різних за характером проєктів, що займаються і е, усна історія, нерівнозначні. Не всі вони враховують досвід попередників, а ще важливіше – їхніх помилок. Тому дуже часто у суспільстві виникають питання, усна історія – це взагалі історичне джерело, а не художній твір чи продукт пам'яті, який, можливо, е, буде вивчати психологія. Чи маємо ми відкидати все те, що не знаходить відображення в архівних джерелах, підходити до усної історії виключно з позиції кліометрики? Яке значення відіграє сучасна, оцифрована та доступна усна історія? Чи не деформує вона колективну пам'ять або чи не знищить взагалі колективну пам'ять про події Голодомору? І рефлексія Аляйди Асман, як ніколи актуальні зараз у 88-й роковині Голодомору, коли свідків цієї події вже скоро не залишиться. У 
в такій ситуації важко прогнозувати, яким шляхом буде розвиватися усна історія Голодомору надалі. А вона, звичайно, буде розвиватися. Усні історії Голодомору нині також виповнюється 88. Вивчення історії свідчень розпочала українська історіографія Олександра Веселова. Хоча спогади як історичне джерело використовувались увесь цей час. Веселова узагальнила інформацію про перші свідчення. Вона зазначила, що серед перших були праці, ґрунтовані на свідченнях західних дослідників, таких як Аменде в книзі «Чи мусить Росія голодувати?» чи Чемберлен у книзі Лайенса «Ми охоплюємо світ». Це ще 30-ті роки. Можна лише вклонитись перед збирачами свідчень та оповідачами із української діаспори. Оскільки за відсутності архівних документів СССР в іншомовному середовищі вони могли уявлятися оточуючим як носіїх виробливих фантазій або жильгідними скелиями після репортажів Волтера Дюранті, заяв Еріо перед фанатами СРСР серед закордонних комуністичних організацій та після схвальних висловлювань про радянський лад відомих діячів культури, таких як Бернард Шоу чи Герберт Уелс. Це подвиг, який ми маємо вшанувати. Вони свідчили про злочин Голодомора перед усім світом і проти майже усього світу. Це дорогого коштує. Цей досвід свідчень варто досліджувати. Вдається важливим зрозуміти, що відчували перші оповідачі, розповідаючи про свій трагічний досвід. Як зустріли їхні свідчення у суспільстві, реакцію на них, як це вплинуло на їхнє подальше життя. Про що вони промовчали? що не бажали розповісти. Це допоможе нам з'ясувати, як пам'ять про Голодомор пережила шалений тиск радянського режиму та радянської пропаганди та зробити висновки, як надалі зберігати пам'ять про цю подію. Спогади, зібрані і записані у повоєнний період, відрізняються детальністю, адже з того часу пройшло лише 20-30 років. Як, наприклад, свідчення Кашинської Ганни 1920 12-го року народження, записані в 1950-му, села Глодося, Новоукраїнського району Кіровоградської області. Це колишня Херсонська губернія. Тогочасники або діаспоріані називають цю територію Херсонщиною, на відміну від Херсонщини, яку сучасні мешканці України асоціюють з Херсонською областю. Це один із 16 спогадів про Голодомор з архіву Українського культурного освітнього центру осередок у Мінніпезі. Вони були зібрані в рамках конкурсу, що проводився в кінці 40-х на початку 50-х про Другу світову війну. Як приклад, спогади Ганни Кашинської щодо їх верифікації – Тут дуже такі цікаві спостереження. Я відкрила сайт села Глодоси, територіальної громади, і знайшла на цьому сайті статтю із історії міста сіл «Вочевидь». І там про 32-33 рік говориться про переможний крок сільського будівництва, про успішну розбудову сільського господарства. Але ось... Кашинська свідчить зовсім про інші речі. Вона називає також в цих спогадах деякі дані. Вона вказує, що із села Глодоси, яке, на її думку, нараховувало 25 тисяч осіб, залишилося в живих 4 тисячі. Це якраз відсилка до Аляйди Асман. Справа в тому, що село Голодоси ніколи не мало 25 тисяч осіб. Але ось істинність хибних спогадів, верифікація цих спогадів, можливо, це якраз у ті моменти, пов'язані із їхнім аналізом. Ми можемо припустити, що Кашинська дитиною покинула своє село і більше ніколи туди не верталася, тому що вона згадує, що її родину було розкуркулено. І про своє село у неї збереглися досить такі травматичні спогади. І, можливо, це перебільшення, ця деформація пов'язана саме з цим. 
Але те, що пам'ять жива і нічого не забуто і в Україні, засвідчує колекція Володимира Маняка та Лідії Коваленко. Маняк – відоме нам видання, про яке згадувала на початку першої панелі вчора Наталія Ханенко-Фрізен. Ця колекція також представлена на сайті Грек у вигляді 700 оригінальних листів, переданих Грек Володимиром Батюком. Взагалі це чудове видання, маю на увазі письмове видання, що містить докладні спогади, зокрема, там дуже багато спогадів про південь України. Але переглядаючи ці листи у вигляді сканів на сайті Грек, починаючи з конвертів, ще з радянською символікою, кінчаючи почерком тих людей, які їх писали, це взагалі дуже хвилюючий досвід, відчуття, наче ці листи адресовані саме тобі, наче вони йшли 30 років і ось нарешті ти їх отримав. Спогади зібрані Маняком та Коваленком відрізняються від тих, що були записані 2008 року, про це, що мова буде йти далі, адже між ними розрив 17 років. А від подій, які вони описують, вже минуло 60 і 75 років відповідно. Втрачаються деталі, але водночас з'являються нові персонажі та подробиці. Це завжди надихає збирачів усної історії. Ми віримо в те, що ніколи не буває занадто пізно, що покоління, яке йде, воно передає свою пам'ять наступному. Ще одна чудова колекція на сайті Грек – це проєкт Привійського центру вивчення української спадщини, що базується на оцифровці інтерв'ю, записаних у 1993-1995 роках під керівництвом Вільяма Нола. Воно представляє 126 інтерв'ю на сайті проєкту. Інтерв'ю районовані за географічною ознакою, вони надзвичайно цікаві та важливі. Але, на жаль, саме мій регіон Південь України слабо представлений в них. Не знаємо, з чим це пов'язано, можливо, якесь упередження щодо півдня, можливо, вони просто географічно не війшли у спектр охоплення респондентів. Але якраз дуже-дуже шкода, що саме в цьому проєкті немає. Можливо, вони не оцифровані. Не знаю, що з цього приводу. Можливо, якась ще інформація надійде. Так само ще один проєкт «80 історій до 80-річчя», започаткований до 80-х роковин Голодомору, конгресів українців Канади та світовим конгресом українців, містить досить цікаві відеоспогади українців діаспоріан, проте трохи бракує науково-довідкового апарату до них. Ми можемо їх дивитися і слухати, відео дуже гарної якості, Повідання надзвичайно інформативні, але ось немає географічної прив'язки. Тобто ці історії могли трапитися будь-де в Україні. За змістом інтерв'ю, це в основному центральна Україна – Київщина, Сумщина, Полтавщина. Чудово, що автори проєкту додаватимуть інтерв'ю на кожні роковини до 23 листопада. Для сучасного стану розробки проблеми, де вже важливі найменші деталі, що розширять якусь інформацію про практику виживання спротиву, обставини смерті, місця поховання, вони матимуть наукову цінність, якщо буде вказана хоча б географія спогадів. Але це цінно, можна досліджуватися, можна досліджувати, вибачте, як сформувалася пам'ять без радянського пропагандистського шуму, які чинно, Ники також впливали замість нього на неї за океаном. І це тема для окремого дослідження, на мою думку, чудово, що такі проєкти є і продовжують функціонувати. Цікавий проєкт «Ті, хто пережив Голодому», розповідає свої історії, ініційований Українським канадським науково-документальним центром у співбраці з Конгресом українців Канади, розміщений на сайті ГРЕК що представляє свідчення українців Канади. Оповідачі покинули Україну з дебільшого повоєнний час, в кінці 40-х років. Свідчення записані у 2008-2009 році. Вони важливі, оскільки містять інформацію про технології Голодомору, практики виживання, спротив та допомогу в часи Голодомору. 
Так, наприклад, це спогади Миколи Латишко про події 32-33 років в селі Іванівці Херсонської області. Вони розповідають про технології влаштування голоду совєтською владою на прикладі рідного села Миколи Іванівка. Тут є важливий такий сюжет, який є досить рідкісний, він не часто повторюється. І важливий він для розуміння саме практик виживання під час Голодомору саме на півдні України. Втеча до Криму. От він представлений в подібних спогадах. Крим на той час уже набув слави здравниці, туди можна було потрапити за путівкою і от, готуючи... До іншого проєкту фотодокументів, який ми будемо незабаром презентувати, я переглядала фотографії, є фото відпочиваючих 1933 року у Керчі, це представники місцевої партійної верхівки, дотичні до них люди. А в спогадах відображені ситуації, коли люди намагалися втекти від голоду, від переслідування боржники хлібоздачі, від звинувачення у куркульстві, від арешту, рятуючи своє життя. І в основному оповідачі говорять про те, як їм це вдалося. А архівні документи розповідають про полювання на українських куркулів в Криму за допомогою міліції сільських рад. І тоді разом вмальовується якась спільна, цілісна картина ситуації. Таких моментів є багато. Свідчення допомагають розібратися, витлумачити архівні документи, що не відображають явища в цілому, допомагають знайти пояснення фотодокумента. Як і вже було зазначено, я брала участь у підготовці книги пам'яті по своєму регіону, по Херсонській області. У 2007 році за указом президента Ющенка до заходів у зв'язку з 75-ми роковинами Голодомору, починаючи з квітня 2007 року, в усіх районах Херсонської області працювало 386 пошукових груп. Вони складалися з працівників сільрад, учителів, учнів, архівістів і краєзнавців. У газеті було опубліковано спеціальне звернення з відозвою надати свідчення, розповісти про те, що, вони, що люди пережили під час Голодомору. Також було звернення надати фотографії, якщо вони є, передати їх у місцеві архіви. Тоді було опитано по Херсонській області більше ніж 16, практично 17 тисяч осіб віком 75 років і старше. Ну, це досить таки великий процент із всіх, хто проживала, а це 29,3%. На той момент було 57 тисяч 700 осіб у Херсонській області такого віку, тобто потенційних свідків, які могли надати свідчення. Ця робота продовжувалася, вона почала завершуватися десь у травні 2008 року і було записано 3225 свідчень про Голодомор 32. 33 років. На жаль, фотографій і аудіозаписів було не зроблено настільки багато, як можна було очікувати. Кількість документів у цьому фонді перевищила 5 тисяч. Ну, я на той момент забезпечувала саме виявлення архівних документів. Я не займалася збором на, на той момент свідчень. Але коли ця колекція надійшла з, після уже видання е, книги пам'яті, то я займалася опорядкуванням цих документів як архівіст. Тобто переглянула кожен із цих спогадів. Ви розумієте, що така кількість спогадів, вона е, фізично не могла увійти у е, книгу пам'яті по Херсонській області. Тобто публікувалися вибрані спогади. Uh, і для мене це був такий uh, тяжкий і цікавий досвід порядкувати таку кількість документів. Uh, у сусідній Одеській області було зібрано спогадів лише на тисячу більше, хоча вона більш багатонаселена, але там було більше зібрано фото і відеодокументів. Uh, чому... Uh, 
23%. Чому люди, ну, скажімо так, відмовлялися давати свідчення? Ну, наприклад, з 389 жителів Береславського району було, описано, було опитано 372 особи, а зібрано всього 191 свідчення. 128 осіб не змогли їх надати за станом здоров'я, 37 не визнали себе постраждалими внаслідок голоду, тобто відмовились на цій підставі давати свідчення, 13 померло до початку опитування і 20 виїхали за межі райони, не пам'ятають ці події 11 і відмовилися давати свідчення 9. Лариса Левченко, яка тоді зараз посідає посаду директора одного з нашого центральних архівників, вона працювала директором Державного архіву Миколаївської області, говорила і писала свої статті про те, що представники комуністичної партії агітували людей, щоб вони не давали цих свідчень. Але е, ті, хто займається збором е, свідчень, ми прекрасно знаємо, що е, зовсім не всі люди готові поділитися своїми історіями, навіть якщо в них немає якихось е, ідеологічних чи е, якихось інших проблем, тому що це дуже важко е, скаж, сказати щось на кабару. Тому, звичайно, е, такі свідчення вони є е, дуже важливими. В кінці 2008 році ця колекція була передана на державне зберігання, з них сформовано 145 справ. Власне, ці спогади були використані мною для підготовки моєї статті, присвячено дитинству і голодомору на прикладі півдня України. Це був аналіз не лише змісту тих спогадів, які е, е, були, знаходилися в архіві. Це також був аналіз тих оціночних суджень, які е, люди висловили, е, які е, вільно або невільно виявлялися е, в їх показах е, і були записані. Те, що самих записів замало, про необхідність відеозапису, наголошував ще в процесі збору спогадів Український інститут національної пам'яті. Але, на жаль, ну, знов таки, в Херсонській області інтерв'ю було дійсно зібрано небагато. Це було пов'язано з тим, що технічних можливостей особливо не було і не можна порівняти можливості сьогоднішньої техніки із тими, що в нас були на момент саме того часу. А ці е, відео, вони зберігаються в Державному архіві Херсонської області, е, вони зберігаються на CD-дисках, це, звичайно, не дуже е, такий надійний насій, хоча ці відео, вони... Те, що от були такі технічні проблеми з записом, вони характеризуються тим, що вони є досить короткими. Тобто це хвилина з чимось, це там дві хвилини з чимось, це ну, там три, по три хвилини навіть свідчень і немає. Це ємність носіїв, мені здається, що це з цим пов'язано. Основний акцент у зборі свідчень 2007-2008 років, років у Херсонській області було зроблено на інтерв'ю з респондентами у сільській місцевості. Містяні залишилися неопитаними. Проте якраз одним із наслідків Голодомору була урбанізація населення. Люди покидали село і переїжджали до міста. Цей сегмент варто було охопити, зважаючи на те, що пройшло багато часу і в Херсоні, і в області ще проживають люди, не охоплені опитуванням. І от таких респондентів було виявлено під час іншого проєкту меморіального центру Голокосту Бабен Яр. Це був збір спогадів, присвячений Голокосту і Другій світовій війні. Проте самі інтерв'ю, проведені на основі опитування, а, ваш час вже вийшов. Прошу вибачення, прошу вибачення. 
вчительська. Я б хотіла тоді продемонструвати з вашого дозволу декілька інтерв'ю, які більш красномовні, я сподіваюся, ніж я сама. Так, зараз. Мій студент записував. Я пам'ятаю, в час Голодомора, це був 33-й рік, коли я ходив до Голода бабушки. Бабушки вже було в то час десь около 100, тому що вона вмерла в то три роки. Ну і я ходив там, значить, до бабушки, значить, в село. Так, там така площа, вона була заселена пшеніці. І цю пшеніцю охороняли воєнці в 33-м році. Хто зайшов в це поле, його стріляли без перегляду. Ну, от коли я йшов, значить, я бачив там, значить, ця струпа полк. Не чути нічого, пані Наталя. Принаймні, я не чую. А його десь сюди, туди ще додому. От жити було дуже трудно. Як то були родичі тут у Херсоні жили, і двоюродний брат, батька. І написав, що тут жити легше. І вони отуди. Приїхали сюди у Велити. Полтавець і батько з Полтавець. Отсюда з Драбова вони. Потім ми, як почалася голодовка. Так, дякую. Прошу вибачення, певні проблеми з інтернетом. От останній... Останній приклад – це якраз одна із практик виживання. На перший погляд, це не дуже інформативне інтерв'ю, але тут говориться про втрату батька-годувальника, його повернення і практика втечі, як втеча від голоду, як успішна практика виживання. Чи є в мене час на висновки, пані Оксано? Немає? На жаль. Ну, буду сподіватися, що буду відповідати тоді вже на питання. Дуже вам дякую. Дякую. Is Holodomor oral history, uh, formation, content, and problems of the sources. Um, Dr. Tatiana Borek received her PhD in history at Charas Shevchenko National University of Kyiv. She is uh, the author and complier of the book 1933, Why Are You Still Alive? Book was published in uh, 2016. She was a Fulbright scholar in uh, 2000. 1614 with the project GIS Atlas of Holdemore. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, can you hear me? And, uh, and do you see my presentation, right? Okay, so good evening, good, good morning. <laughs> 
Um, I'll, uh, let me present some thoughts on my topic, which is Holodomor oral history, aggression content and problems of the, of the sources. Um, let's start with, with numbers and, and this is the, the first issue that has not been solved yet and I'm, 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 I'm working on, on this. Um, so we, ha we have um, we have different uh, numbers from uh, uh, from seventy thousand to more than two hundred thousand of oral history sources. Uh, if we talk about um, the the projects, um, my colleagues Natalia Khanenko Friesen and Natalia Kuzova has mentioned uh, several of uh, the, the the first periods the the. The, uh, the testimonies that had been uh, made public in, in Northern America, then famous uh, Congress project, then in Ukraine, these were the books by Maniak, uh, Maniak Kovalenko already mentioned, also uh, the collection of oral history by a writer Alexander Mishenko on blood war. Um, but then it was a kind of uh, stop period for the, the, the research. Uh, um, it was 1990s and we have uh, here two, uh, uh, two reasons uh, that influenced the process of survivors interviewing and publication. That is economic troubles and, and declassifying of uh, the archives. The, the letter resulted in the intention to find in the archives that exactly that same document about the genocide, as well as, uh, as many problems, uh, uh, many issues on Ukrainian history, like uh, repressions that uh, uh, had to be researched and Holodomor was a kind of lost uh, among this topic. Um, then we had a kind of explosion in, in 2000 and it was obviously connected with uh, the president Viktor Yushchenko and uh, today it's uh, uh, 70th and 75th anniversary uh, of commemoration of um, of victims. Um, we will not, uh, I will not uh, analyze here uh, advantages and drawbacks of interference of politicians into, <laughs> into history researchers. Uh, obviously, uh, such pressure from above uh, to collect and made available for public uh, Holodomor oral history on the one hand resulted into sometimes uh, poor quality of publication and writing down of interviews. Uh, but nevertheless, it was that period uh, 2000s when the majority of oral history sources had been uh, recorded and made available. Uh, for instance, uh, Anatolia Kuzova has mentioned uh, the, 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 the National Memory Book uh, uh, that uh, consisted of 18 volumes and each volume contained, uh, almost each volume uh, contained a section of uh, oral history. Um, uh, now we can state that uh, the process of oral history writing from Holodomor survivors had uh, been uh, almost completed for uh, due to natural reason of generation replacement. And so now we can uh, stop, we can analyze, uh, we can find uh, the problems with the, the source base and uh, suggest uh, some ways of solving this issue. Uh, so if we move to second part of my presentation, content blocks of oral history sources. And here we have to uh, recall about the archival documents on, on Holodomor. Um, uh, so-called uh, classical archival documents from the archives uh, used by historians uh, before accumulation of Holodomor oral history generally have similar narrative and uh, which is partly uh, reproduced in oral history. But firstly, documents uh, 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 describe uh, events aimed at peasants from outside, from a collective farm, from village council, from uh, 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 Ryan authorities, and at the same time, oral history uh, reveal consequences of such influence over a family. Uh, secondly, the degree of ideological tension is another obstacle for evaluation of archival documents, because they tell about gaining a victory on front uh, of grain procurement by the end of the first five-year plan, uh, using corresponding uh, terminology to combat an enemy. Uh, thirdly, archival documents mostly tell about numbers tied to under-fulfillment of the grain 
uh, a procurement plan of a village, of rayon, or oblast. Uh, such documents uh, touch various terms and various administrative units so with corresponding punishment, uh, repressions, or, and traditional plans. Thus, we observe paradoxical situation. There are more than 100,000 of documents in the archives on, on the Holy Moor, but they mostly deal with grain procurements. And documents often do not contain any meaning about a starvation of a region or an administrative unit. Uh, but obviously, there is a certain correlation of oral history uh, sources and classical archival documents. There is correlation of peasants' letter from uh, that uh, time that touches issues uh, which are present in oral history. Also, documents often contain data about search, starvation, uh, cannibalism, uh, children's homelessness, and such data are completely correlated with oral history narrative. And we have to remind that the Soviet authorities deliberately liquidated the majority of the so-called archival, governmental archive of the Ukrainian SSR of 1930, leaving us often oral history as the only source for understanding the Holodomor. Uh, at the same time, uh, oral history sources help uh, uh, to fill in the gaps uh, of documents narrative. Uh, from the time which is winter 1932-33 and spring of 19, spring summer of 1933. And um, archival sources contain such uh, uh, events uh, that I uh, separate in four periods. So the first is end of 1920s, uh, end of autumn, uh, autumn of 1932. And uh, so people recall about a creation of collective farms in the villages, methods of, uh, of representatives, uh, collectivization, decollectivization, entering a collective farm, a deprival of private property, uh, agricultural implements and cattle uh, earned uh, during the new economic policy and resistance in the villages if they exist. Uh, such information could be given by respondents who at that time were at least uh, teenagers. And uh, I should stress that the respondents, uh, they mostly di distinguished collectivization and repression uh, uh, during these years from terror exactly during the beginning of the Holodomor. Uh, this one more time confirms uh, Kuchitsky of uh, uh, concept of uh, Stanislav Kuchitsky, Ukrainian historian, of transfer of old Union famine in the USSR into, into the Holodomor in Ukrainian SSR. Uh, second period is end of 1932, beginning of 1933. And uh, the main point of um, the focus, the main point, the main issue of um, the spirit uh, is uh, searches. Um, they um, they are mentioned in in the majority of testimonies I, I, I worked with, and for obvious reason because the, these searches they, they marked a fracture of of life, uh, and uh, such fracture uh, launch uh, starvation and loss of. of of family members. And so oral history uh, sources describe hiding of food if a family attempt to hide and manage to do this uh, and uh, stressed that the family had survived uh, uh, thanks to hidden food reserves or uh, 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 survivors express uh, despair uh, because of confiscation of hidden food. Uh, next period uh, is winter spring uh, 1933. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the peak of, of the, the Holodomor. So they say about additional searches, about terror, uh, strategies of survival, including cannibalism, starvation, a mortality burial. Uh, description of events in this in this time event group uh, again depend on respondent age because children could tell about events that uh, took place in their families or uh, um, uh, in the in relatives or neighbors, and uh, teenagers could expand sphere of observation to friends and school, and adults obviously could tell more about the situation in the village or uh, or, or neighboring villages. And uh, fourth period uh, is the summer autumn of 1933 that is present in uh, oral history. This is a uh, return to life. Uh, it, uh, it took place mostly in summer when it became possible to to consume what had grown, and especially after harvesting campaign of 1933, when grain or flour uh, had been delivered 
per trudodni. Uh, also, people returned to a village or to a house. They tried to estimate uh, amount of losses. It could take time uh, uh, later um, after this period. But it is interesting to stress that when people tried to estimate uh, how many villagers died, they took uh, amount of dead uh, during the Second World War as an etalon. And, uh, and they stress that, uh, the, the, that more people died in the war than during this um, uh, six months period. A researcher is striking with the uh, unanimity of narrative of oral history sources. Despite of giving above, above possibilities and deviations, a generally coincide description of actions of authorities on forcing peasants into collective farms, applied repressions, uh, searches with uh, iron sticks, strategies of survival, description of those uh, suffered from starvation and, consequence, and consequences of starvation for uh, the whole family. And here I would like to stress that I tried to compare uh, Ukrainian oral history uh, with, uh, with Russian or oral history, but I failed. Um, I found uh, uh, some oral history on uh, the famine in, in the USSR, but um, they do not contain um, a description of such fracture as Ukrainian sources. Uh, a Russian, uh, and those testimonies, uh, those Russian testimonies where a respondent uh, uh, begins to recall searches with confiscation of, of not only grain uh, reserves, but food also, as well as mortality in the family and village. Uh, uh, sounds similar to Ukrainian oral history. And in this case, these Russian testimonies were recorded in Kuban, uh, not in, let's say, uh, the Volga region. Now it was Kuban region. Um, so let's now turn to the uh, third part of, of my presentation, the problems that we have with, um, with Holodomor oral sources. So the first is, uh, as I call it, uh, time and professional background. As I mentioned, uh, first Ukrainian projects on oral history were launched in the end of the 1980s by non-historians. At that time, and further, even, even further in the 1990s, standards for writing down of interviews and methodology of this was used by uh, anthropologists mostly to solve their research problems. And historians in their turn, in, I mean Ukrainian historians at that time, uh, had poor understanding of oral history. Editors of collections uh, of oral history sources had different professional background and influenced, uh, and this influenced their understanding of culture of publication of Holodomor oral history. Uh, next problem is connected with the type of interview. As we know, uh, there are two types of interview, for narrative and formalized. And uh, um, uh, I would agree that uh, combination of these approaches is uh, the, the best option. But here we meet uh, uh, such a problem as uh, uh, professional background of interviewers. And th that's the problem because in many cases, these were students and even, even students of, of high schools and even, even middle schools who uh, provide, uh, who made these uh, interviews. And obviously they did not have enough, uh, enough knowledge to, to conduct uh, free narrative interview in, instead of uh, formalized in, form, in the form of answering the, the questions or like saying yes or no. Uh, next problem is authenticity. Unfortunately, there is information that part of interviews, uh, students, um, interviewers uh, who were students uh, created an oral history source by uh, writing another testimony or by combining uh, several oral history sources. Uh, taking into account the need to question as soon as possible and as many as possible respondents until eyewitnesses <laughs> had not passed away, uh, such manipulations that influenced authenticity of oral history sources uh, I think have to be conditionally integrated into analysis of database of oral history sources. Uh, let's say we have two testimonies uh, uh, that we can 
evaluate as non-credible per, let's say, 100 testimonies. And I believe that negligent approach of some students aimed at gaining of positive um, grade for an interview does not have to become an obstacle for using such type of historical source. Uh, source. And besides, like my colleague uh, Natalia Kuzova mentioned, in many cases uh, there are means of uh, verification of oral history source, uh, audio or video record of an interview, or it could be a signature of a respondent or a seal of a village council, let's say. Uh, the next problem is passportization, and uh, for me it was uh, the biggest problem when working on my project uh, Gisadlas of the Holodomor, that has now been uh, prepared. And so here the main problem is geographical parameter of an event, because often a settlement where a respondent lived uh, during an interview is given as here is his or her place of, of residency during the whole of the more. Sometimes all administrative division is given and th 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 this becomes an obstacle to locate this village on a map nowadays. Sometimes a village is given uh, a title of, of a village is given without a rayon and there could be several villages with the same name in uh, one rayon or uh, in one oblast. In many cases, the villages uh, have ceased to exist. Uh, like for instance, they were uh, they were striking off the register as a non-perspective village or all residents uh, could die out uh, or uh, submerged some villages of villages for reservoirs and dams on the Dnieper River. Uh, next problem is laying on of two famines, the, the Holodomor and the post-war famine. But um, in these cases, it's uh, usually quite easy to distinguish these two famines because, for instance, when a survivor uh, recalls that uh, he or she was using a train to get to Western Ukraine to get some food, obviously he or she uh, recalls not the Holodomor, but um, the post-war famine 1946-1947. Uh, another option that helps to distinguish two famines is, is to compare uh, events uh, described by a respondent with uh, his or her aid. Uh, for instance, um, I recall a testimony when a survivor was about five years old uh, during the Holodomor, and then he started uh, uh, to describe uh, how he was getting to other villages or even, even a town to get some food. So obviously he was recalling not the Holodomor when he had to be five years old and could not make these trips, but it was uh, another famine. Um, the next problem is, uh, is preservation and storage. And uh, absence of one unified uh, storage of archival preservation of world history sources about the famine. Uh, since work took place from the beginning of 1990s, um, uh, many state archival institutions of, of various levels uh, have archival funds with testimonies. In case when local amateurs and cultural workers are collected oral history sources, uh, places of preservation of such documents could become uh, local historical museums, uh, school archives, or even exhibitions in school. Um, and that is why publication of such sources had often become the only way to introduce uh, these sources to researchers and to preserve them because in many cases originals uh, could be lost. Uh, part of such documents was kept by persons whose archives had not been transferred to archival institutions. Also, there is no one unified organ that would work on creation of one unified database of oral history sources. Uh, certain work in this direction is led by the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory and National Museum of the Holodomor Genocide, but not in centralized and unified way. Um, so um, Ukrainian historians taking into account uh, uh, time and financial restrictions could write down as much as possible oral history from eyewitnesses and, and their children as well. But in coordination of their work had resulted into existing problems with the, the source date I've, I've mentioned above. And so I would suggest that the further direction of work uh, I see as finding out of places of preservation of testimonies, both institutional and personal, and, uh, and further work with one unified base for virtual concentration of all collected oral history sources from the topic in, in one place. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, thank you, Tatiana. And um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Hennady Boryak uh, uh, can, can join us today uh, and present his paper, but uh, Dr. Oksana Yurkova agree uh, to read his paper. Uh, so the title of uh, Dr. Boryak's paper is um, Holodomor G Digital Archives as Innovative Universal Network Resource, Documentary and Visual uh, Segments of the Project. Um, Hennady Borek is a professional archivist uh, and historian. Since 2000, uh, he has served as Deputy uh, Director General and Director General of the State Committee on Archives of Ukraine. Currently, he is the Deputy Director of the Institute of History of Ukraine, National Academy of Science of Ukraine. His recent publication concerns the sources for studying the 1932-33 Great Famine. Uh, his current research project, uh, projects also include supervi uh, supervision of the Encyclopedia of History of Ukraine, um, including um, uh, the, the online version of the encyclopedia. So, uh, Dr. Yurkova, please, the floor is yours. Can't hear. You are muted. We can't hear you, I'm sorry. I still can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you, uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, do you see my uh, hello? Uh, do you see my uh, screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry. I don't see you. Don't share. Like at least I don't see. Oh, you. I'm so sorry. I'm trying my best. <laughs> Please take your time and now it's uh, yes. Now we we can see. Well, thanks God. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so I will try to read uh, the text uh, written by uh, Professor Borek. Uh, granting the scholars with access to the huge but uh, unstructured areas of sources very often causes uh, to the paradoxical situation. I mean the feeling of informational hunger as the background of total information overload. Perhaps every one of us knew that feeling. Such tool as intelligent modeling based on digital collections with uh, associative uh, ties between them and reflection of historical context help to cope with the uh, processing of large data sets. At the same time, the modern digital collection, no matter how we call it, either a digital archive or a digital library, electronic archive or so on, uh, enables to combine not only the body of sources from different types and origin, but also different principles of analysis and presentation of historical data in integrated informational environment, such as chronological, geographical, textual, subject, to visual. Uh, the Holodomor Digital Archive Project uh, shall establish the maximum complete uh, consolidated area of uh, bibliographic, uh, historiographical, documentary, narrative, visual, and other data to reconstruct the preconditions, reasons, course of events, and consequences from one of the greatest social catastrophes of the 20th century, the Holodomor genocide of Ukrainian people. Uh, its it's prototype a, it's a, was another project with a loan and not is a history, the Holodomor Electronic Archives. It was launched in the early 
2000s by the State Archival Service of Ukraine, implemented only by a few enthusiasts, uh, professional archivists with partly support of American charitable foundation, the Ukrainian Studies Fund. Its establishment and active filling uh, uh, in was not regulated by any official normative documents. At the same time, it became an integral part of the official web portal of the State Archival Service. And as such, it performed not only the scientific and informational, but also cultural and educational functions at the national level. In autumn 2006, uh, the new management of the archival service started transformation of the political vectors and scientific priorities in activity of state active archives. Gradually, gradually this resource was marginalized, it became more and more inconvenient and even harmful, depending on the political beliefs that the chief of the archival administration used to have. Nevertheless, this resource still exists in the internet and preserves the archaic software and design as the memorial. Though there are no direct links to it on the official uh, uh, archival website now, it is hidden in section documentary exhibitions online. The electronic archive had a quite simple structure. Its central core is the array of archival documents and oral evidence from 1929-1934, which have been published since the early 1990s and presented in the format of a full-text document-by-document database with a chronological index. The list of available documents for a specific month and day is automatically generated at the request of the user. All texts, of course, had appropriate metadata, that is titles, archival, and bibliographic references. The separate section contains a full text document. These uh, are document collections of partly of party and Soviet documents published 1990 and 1992, fundamental documentary compendium by Ruslan Perib. Collections of regional documents published by regional archives in Vinnytsia, Zaporizhia, Kirovograd, Luhansk, Mikolaev, Kharkiv, Odessa, Poltava, Suma, Cherkasa, and Chernobyl. At the end of 2008, the first 1,500 documents were included into this online database. In the future, the digitized archival documents should be included into the database so that the published transcripts could be correlated with the images of their archival counterparts. Unfortunately, this super task remains unfulfilled. The important components of Holodomor electronic archives were the areas of visual sources from the collection of the Central State Film and Photo Archive, placed in section Context of the Tragedy. Uh, there were more than 130 photo documents, as well as about 200 selected frames from original documentary chronicles. Some of them are unique, that have never been reproduced before. Another interesting section of memorial character is the collection of empty hyperlinks to the original documentary exhibitions on Holodomor, presented in 2007-2008 on the websites of state archives and regional state administrations, which actually lead to now here. For the Yanukovych presidency in 2010-2011, these resources were cleaned up. Same with large collection of digitalized documents from the archives of the Security Service of Ukraine, which granted and open access to its resources in 2008. It was also cleaned up in 2010. One more story. In the mid-2000, uh, an extremely huge and still unsurpassed online collection of digitized oral evidences entitled uh, one, uh, 
1,900 eyewitness accounts of the Holodomor was posted on the web by Ukraine 3000 Foundation. But in 2007, it was destroyed during a hacker attack. And now this is another death hyperlink. Today we have every reason to locate the source of that attack unmistakably. The experience acquired in the 2000s served to, to implement further modern network initiatives, including Holodomor, a digital archive project. We studied this activity in 2020. The project team consists of four persons, myself, that is Yenadi Borek, my colleagues Oksana Yurkova and Tatiana Amirchuk from the Institute of History of Ukraine, as well as Katerina Lobuzina from Vernadsky National Library of Ukraine, who ensures the software and hardware support. We used the model of Mikhailo Grushevsky Digital Archive Project, which has been operating since 2016, thanks to support of Ukrainian Studies Fund and Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. The Holodomor Digital Archive was based on the consolidated register of published documents about Holodomor compiled in 2008. As of today, uh, the Holodomor Digital Archives uh, uh, includes about 3,800 documents. The main components of uh, metadata are date, title, geographical and administrative location, document description, storage location, archival code, information about publication, reference to the digital image of document in case if it is available. The chronological index is automatically generated and it ensures the selection of materials at different levels such as year, month, specific date. The administrative location of settlements uh, is related to the dates and thus it is presented according to the appropriate administrative and territorial structure of Ukraine. All geographical parameters are linked to the interactive map of the Holodomor and it allows users to search for documents by region. The map is based on a famous Harvard project entitled The Map digital atlas of Ukraine. The general Unfortunately, it seems that uh, we have some connection problem. Dr. Yurkova, I, I can't hear her and she is frozen and I um, got messages. Uh, so, uh, can I uh, continue? The we can, yeah, we can hear you. No. To process and to grant an access to photo documents of the interval period stored in museums of key regions. In general, F, as of today, the visual history of collectivization and the Holodomor is being reconstructed on the basis of just a few photo collections. Perhaps the most popular and the most reproduced among them is the collection of Austrian engineer Alexander Wienerberger, over 50 photos. It was reprinted many times in various publications since 1934. Since the 1990s, the very popular are the documentary photo of the 1920s and 1930s by photographer Marko Zalizniak from Donetsk region, which captures the everyday life of the Ukrainian village. Since 2007, the small collection of amateur photographer Mikola Bakan from Baturin 
uh, that was found in the security service archives in Chernihiv region has become a part of the Holodomor visual service. Collection of photos from the 1920s and 1930s are kept in central and regional archives. First of all, in Chernihiv Central State uh, Film and Photo Archive of Ukraine. This is the largest collection that has about 200 photo documents. The uh, valuable photo collections of the interwar period taken in Ukraine are kept in the Russian Federation, in particular in the Russian State Archive of Film and Photo Documents, and in the State Central Museum of Model History of Russia, Moscow. They are almost unknown to public. Of course, for us, high-quality scans of these photo documents are inaccessible. Their copies are available in the electronic catalog in the preview format only. The visual documents are attracting more and more attention. In Ukraine, the Holodomor Research and Educational Center, headed by Ludmila Grinevich, carries out the systematic activity in this direction. In 2018 and 19, uh, the center held two forums devoted to the problems uh, of visual sources of the Holodomor era and their interpretation. In 2020, in Canada, uh, CREC created a new web resource with the Holodomor photo directory. Today, it features about 100 original photo collections by Wiener Berger and Bokan, as well as two little known collections of photos that were made in Ukraine by Americans, namely by photographer James Ebbe and businessman Whiting Williams. Only a small part from this array of photo documents about the Holodomor is actively used. Besides, these are in fact the same photos and they are also not very representat uh, representative in terms of geography, as were taken mostly in Kharkiv, Chernihiv and Donetsk regions. It gives rise to the question about radical expansion of the research field and the involvement not only archival, but also museum and family collections into the complex of visual evidence for the interwar period. The support from GREC enabled our team to launch a project since 2020, which aims carefully to study the photo collections from local law museums in 17 current oblasts of Ukraine, which cover six former oblasts of the Holodomor. We decided to study the model for research methods of museum collections in Kyiv region. Within the working hypothesis, we assumed that a certain but insignificant number of original local photos was probably kept in the expositions and repositories of local museums. Regarding the chronological terms, we decided to consider the Holodomor era as wide as possible as an interwar period without clear lower date. The beginning of the German-Soviet war became the formal upper limit. We started our field work in the difficult COVID year. As it turned out, no one had ever systematically studied the collection of photo documents from local law and history museums, even in the capital region. And our working hypothesis was refuted on the first day of the expedition. It was a Buhiv that we started from. Later, a huge number of original visual documents from the interwar period with local origin, which are kept in museum collections, simply impressed us, especially in Kaharlik, Bohuslav, Zhishchev, Obuhiv, Etiyev, Borispil, Yagotin, and some other towns and even villages like Bobritz. In total, we made uh, 30 expeditions for two years. We uh, surveyed uh, uh, 63 museums with various forms of ownership, state, public, private, of different types and subordination, regional, district, city, rural, uh, museums of the history of enterprises, museums of higher education institutions, school museums, museum rooms of rural clubs, historical, archaeological, historical and local law, memorial museums, museums of antiquities, and even family archives. 
for various reasons, we have not been able to process the museum collections at about 15 settlements of Kiev region. This is at least five more expeditions. At the beginning, we used the data from the Ministry of Culture and compiled the list of 30 museums, but our fieldwork has doubted this optimistic quantity. It turned out that, in fact, there are many more museum institutions outside the formal sphere of activity of the Ministry of Culture. Given the large volume of collections of some museums, we had to visit them two or three times. We visited the museums with very good funding and a large staff, up to 60 people, for example, in Bila Tserkva. We were depressed on seeing the museums that barely survive as they had one or two employees, like in village Sosnova, Borispa district. We were in museums that were robbed for many times as they were not properly secured. We talked to museum workers who are professional historians and have been to museums where a former collective farmer or a tractor driver took care of them. But we have not seen any indifferent people. Even in the poorest museum, we were hospitably welcomed and granted the full access to the collections. I would like to mention that some non-state museums have the touching names. Father's hut, uh, house, Batkivska Hata in Maslivka, Berehinia, Guardian uh, in uh, Staiki. In total, uh, we collected about 1,200 uh, photo documents from the Holodomor era. Until now, we managed to publish uh, on the project website only one fourth from them, over 300 photos. The rest are still waiting uh, to be proceeded. We classified and systemized them. We understand that such a uh, working structure uh, may be changed and supplemented. Uh, we have to admit that metadata processing is a very laborious process, as well as the technical work with scans. The attribution and the detailed description of such visual source requires a considerable research effort and knowledge of the historical context. In conclusion, I would like to add uh, that during the expedition, uh, for two years, we passed about 9,000 kilometers by roads in key region. One can uh, consider that we overcame the distance between Kiev and uh, Edmonton by car. Frankly speaking, it was only one way drive. Therefore, in order to return home, we should obviously take one of the regions close to Kiev and continue the museum survey project for at least another two years. This is a joke, and if seriously, the question about the format in which this pilot project could be continued remains open. Finally, our working group is also open to constructive suggestions. In general, it concerns not only to the visual part of this large-scale project. The task of the Holodomor Digital Archive as a universal network uh, thematic resource is to uh, integrate all relevant sources and researchers. In fact, we are really at a very uh, early stage of the project. The potential volume of photo documents uh, reaches, according to our very preliminary estimates, 15, 20,000 units. More than 200,000 archival records are also subject to inclusion into digital archive. 50, 60,000 oral testimonies, up to 15,000 full text monographs, brochures, scientific, journalistic, and popular articles, media publications. Processing of this array requires significant intellectual and technical efforts and serious financial resources. Finally, let me again thank the Ukrainian Studies Fund and the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies for support in those projects and express my gratitude to the team of our project, especially to my reliable companion, Aksana Yurkova. 
I would also uh, uh, I uh, would like also to know that uh, this short speech is based on the article which we have written together with Oksana Yorkova and Katerina Labuzina and published in Ukrainsky Historichny Journal thing, uh, uh, this year. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you very much. And now Dr. Yurkova will present her paper. Um, her paper, Ukrainian photographer Petro Kravchenko and his Vodomor era uh, photos. Um, Dr. Yurkova is a leading researcher at the Institute of History of Ukraine, National Academy of Science of Ukraine in Kyiv, Ukraine. She studies Ukrainian history of the 20th century, especially focusing on the interwar period, uh, ethnography, anthropology of academic life, and electronic information resources. Since 2016, she is a project uh, leader um, of the Mikhailo Hrushevsky uh, Digital Archives. Since to, uh, 2020, she works on the visual database of the Holodomor Digital Archive. Uh, project title is uh, Scattered and Unknown Holodomor Era Visual Documents. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yes, but try to uh, to to show us next slide because you uh, in your pre previous pre uh, presentation we actually didn't see slides so we just saw the first one. So try to still see. Do you see the second? No, we can see only the um, the first one. Uh, Tom, can you see? And what about the first one? Uh, we, now we, we see just the first slide. So we. Uh, we uh, my, oh, my first slide or Boric's first slide? Your first slide. Oh, okay. It's, it's great. Uh, uh, thank you for your support. In uh, 2020 2021, due to the support of the Holodomor Research and Educational Consortium, uh, our small researchers team worked on the pilot project scattered and unknown Holodomor era visual documents Kiev region. Uh, and uh, so my presentation will be the continuation of uh, Gennady Borek's um, presentation. Uh, our project was aimed at thorough investigation of the interwar photo collections of the local lawyer museums of Kiev Oblast which subsequent online publication of the annotated digital copies of the revealed visual documents. At the beginning of the presentation, I would like to make a few general remarks uh, on our fieldwork scheme. I think that only
das uh, taken in Nazi Germany in 1942. More than once, we identified uh, interwar photos on the basis of the analysis of the photo paper, passport to seals, inscriptions on the backs of the photos, photo subjects, people's poses, clothes, slogans, even makes of the tractors, etc. Of course, it was uh, important to see all interval photos from the museum stock collections. Very often, museum workers misunderstood our aim and claimed absence of the Holodomor era photos in their stock collections. As you might guess, they meant absence of the 1932-1933 photos of dying or dead people, as one can see at, for instance, Alexander Wienerberger's photos. Only due to our communication with museum workers and detailed explanations that not only photos with corpse could tell the truth about the Holodomor, we gained access to the photos which were put aside. I have thought you did not need them. This phrase we had very often. It goes without saying that among photos rejected by the museum workers, there were many valuable and informative ones. This case is convinced us that face-to-face -face communication with museum workers and personal expertise are very important. The next step was the digitalization of the selected photo documents. Unfortunately, many local museums have neither personal computers nor scanners. Plus, the majority of museum workers have no professional skills for such work. Without undue modesty, I want to underline that only due to my personal devices, laptop, photo camera and scanner, and professional skills, this digitalization became possible. It may be noted that we always left digital copies in the museums and museum workers were very grateful to them. To sum up the story, without close communication with museum workers, personal expertise of the museum photo documents and personal digitalization, we would never have collected so many photos. During our field work, we discovered a great amount of the 1920s, 1930s original photos of high quality. We scrutinized them closely and revealed that many photos were taken in photo studios. Group planner, indicated that they were taken by professional photographers. Some photos had letterings in relief or seals with photographers' names and photographers' addresses. Frankly speaking, we were greatly surprised by the quantity of the cameramen who had worked in the cities, towns, and even big villages in the interwar period. Unfortunately, most local museum workers could not provide us with the information about the 1920s, 1930s local photographers. Moreover, in the majority cases, we were the first who paid attention on photographers' names and addresses. On the basis on the quantity of the interwar authors' photos, we can suggest that the ordinary viewpoint that there were only few photographers in Soviet Ukraine at the time is not entirely true. Yes, since the beginning of the 1921st century, we know and use Marko Zalizniak photo collection. Since 2007, we know and use Mikola Bokan photos. But until now, we have no information about other photographers, both professional and amateurs, who definitely worked in Ukraine in the 1920s, 1930s. Even according to the incomplete database of the repressed persons, Rehabilitovani uh, story, in Kyiv Oblast, there were at least five photographers who were sentenced to death in 1937, 1938. Up to now, their names and photos, as well as names and photos of other interwar Ukrainian photographers are absent in academic and informational usage. During our field work in local law museums, 
of Kiev Oblast uh, we discovered few photographers whose interwork photos are worth to be widely used as the visual documents of the Holodomor era. One of them was Petro Krauchenko, and now I would like to present him and his interwerks. We got acquainted with Krauchenko's photos in a Buhiv, which is located 40 kilometers south of Kiev, on the right bank of the Dnieper. Officially, in the 20s, early 30s, Buhiv was a village, but sometimes it was called Mistechko, a town. Now Buhiv is a city and the administrative center of the Buhiv rayon. The Buhiv Regional Local Law Museum is situated in the center of Buhiv in the building of the state administration on the third floor. The museum was founded in 1984. Now the museum is named after its late director, Yuri Domatenko, who was its actual creator and designer. In the 1980s, 90s, it was Domatenko who gathered a vast collection of the local photo documents, including Krauchenko's photos. The collection photos taken in the 1930s uh, by Krauchenko and other photographers formed the basis of museum's expedition, uh, exhibition hall devoted to the interwar period, period and the Holodomor. Also, they are used as the ethnographic exhibition hall. It should be noted that currently the Buhiv Museum exposition presents all photographs in copies, but that was not always the case. Almost until recently, the exposition was created of the original images. It's sad to say, but some of the original photos were previously damaged by Domatenko himself. He cropped photos according to his own vis vision of the exhibition. So some photos and inscriptions on the back sides of the photos are not full. Nevertheless, the museum photo collection is rather impressive. Now we have more than 150 digital images of the interwar uh, photos in our base. In the nearest future, all of them will be put online in open access uh, at the website of the Holodomor Digital Archive. The Obuhio Museum demonstrates modern and innovative model of the visual story about the Holodomor. The museum presents only local photos with the appropriate annotations describing people or events. These annotations were made by Yuri Domatenko on the basis of eyewitnesses' evidences in the 1990s, early 2000s, and are very eloquent. They inform about the further hunger deaths, decolocalization, exiles, executions of the people at the photos and their family members. Many of the uh, photographs presented in the interwar exhibition hall were taken by Petro Kravchenko. In the 1930s, 1960s, Petro Kravchenko definitely was the most famous Abuhiv photographer. In 1999, Yuri Domatenko published a photo album composed from Kravchenko's photos taken in the 1930s, 1960s. This collection testified the photographer's high level in the photo genre, staged and art photography. Petro Kravchenko was born in a poor peasant family in 1909. His father, Pavlo, had a knack for art and crafts. He painted and restored church buildings and icons. Petro inherited from his father a passion for art and became interested in photography. In 1921, Petro Kravchenko got married. The couple lived in a private house in the center of a buhi. Petro added the second half to the house and opened his photo studio. Since 1930, Kravchenko began to mark his photos by a special seal with his name. Photo studio became very popular, especially among young people. Kravchenko worked in all genres. He made individual and family portraits, both in his photo studio and in the open air, featured everyday life in Obuhiv and nearby. 
For instance, well-known portrait of a famous Ukrainian poet, Andriy Malishka, at that time a student, was taken by Krauchenko in 19... Dr. Yurkova, we can't see the, the, your pictures, your slide, slides. We, we can okay. see them, so... Yes, now, now... Yes, thank you. And what about now? Yes, now uh, we can see next slide, yes. Is it okay? Yes, yes, no. But you have to to um, yeah to manage uh, the presentation so we can see it. Excuse me, uh, maybe it's because of my internet connection. Uh, 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 do you see the uh, portrait of Malishka? Так, yes. Like, okay. Uh, the Obuhio Museum uh, keeps many individual group and uh, family photo portraits of his work. And uh, these are the examples of Kravchenko's photos which were taken uh, in the early 1930s. The background of Kravchenko's photo studio is quite recognizable. It looked like a typical Ukrainian landscape with a house with a thatched uh, roof near the river, windmill trees and sunflowers. A model of a fence was made near the backdrop. Krauchenko probably constructed the backdrop and other decorations himself. As you can see, Krauchenko's studio photos taken in the 1930s are quite perfect as for a young photographer. The Buhiv Museum also preserves Krauchenko's staged propaganda photos of the activists and collective farmers that uh, uh, taken mainly in the field. You can see peasants at harvest in 1931, Buhiv Komsomol members uh, in 1932, the activists of the Buhiv collective farm in 1932 and collective farmers in the field. At the Krauchenko's photos, we can also see the members of amateur art groups of the 1930s, teachers and pupils. Unfortunately, we weren't able to see all the origins of the photos printed in the photo album. Museum workers told us that some photos the Matenko uh, director of the museum took home and they were lost after his death. But now there are no Krauchenko's photos with dying people like Alexander Wienerberger's ones. But his photos are very valuable because they fixed changes that took place in the Holodomor era Soviet Ukraine. Moreover, due to Domachenko, who had collected oral stories, we know that many depicted by Krauchenko people, including children, died during the Holodomor. In 1932, the local newspaper Kolgostnik Obushkivshiny was founded and Krauchenko began to cooperate with it. Of course, uh, sometimes it's very hard to identify pictures that were published in that newspaper in the first half of the 1930s as photos. But captions under that pictures marked them as photographs and we can't distrust them. Unfortunately, at that time, the newspaper did not name the local authors of the published photos. Meanwhile, the names of Moscow photojournalists were mentioned. So at the moment, I can only suppose that the majority of the local photos in Kolgosnikobuhirshiny were taken by Petro Krauchenko. Among them, there were many portraits, especially portraits of uh, agricultural leaders, Paradovaki Silsko Gospodarstva, activists, and some staged propaganda photos. There is no information, certain information about Kravchenko's life in Nazi occupation. Probably he lived in Obuhiv and continued to work as a photographer, as we can suppose on the basis of few photos which were taken definitely in his photo studio in 1942 and 1943. 
When Soviet army uh, came into Abu Ghraib in late 1933, Kravchenko was mobilized to the army. In 1944, he was awarded by a medal, and few of his photographs were accurately taken abroad, not in Ukraine. Maybe he was a photographer in the army. Nobody knows at, at the moment. After the war, he continued his career as a photographer and a photo correspondent of the local newspaper. He died in 1974. There is no exact information about his own photo archive. We have heard various rumors about it. The only hope is that the photos taken by Krauchenko are still kept in the families of Abuhiv residents. In addition to the uh, Abuhiv Museum workers, we talked to the principals of the Abuhiv Folk Art Center. The center also preserves photos made by Obuhi photographer Petro Krauchenko. Due to our uh, Holodomor digital archive, we will unite both collections. And uh, my conclusions. Uh, Petro Krauchenko was one of the talented Ukrainian photographers who had worked since the late 1920s. He have survived the Holodomor and Second World War but his heritage is known only in Abuhi. Krauchenko's case clearly demonstrates lack of information even about well-known at the local level photographers. We got acquainted with Krauchenko's photos only due to the project scattered and unknown Holodomor era visual documents. There is no doubt that we need to continue museum expeditions. I believe we will discover dozens of unknown interval photographers and hundreds of the interval focus, photos. In this way, we will significantly expand the visual history of the interval period and the Holodomor in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yurkova. And uh, I would like to invite now Vlana Babi to comment on the uh, this uh, four presentations. Uh, Lana Babi is a retired professional librarian with many years uh, of service at the University of Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Stores. In 2016, she initiated a project to investigate and auto uh, authenticate photographs taken by foreigners claiming to depict the Holodomor with the ultimate aim of creating an online uh, directory of, uh, of scientific photographs. With the support of HRAC, uh, and particularly Marta Baziuk and research as, uh, assistants, uh, assistants um, Nastasia Leschishin and Daria Glaskova, who also uh, developed the Nikolai Bokan uh, collection, the first edition of the Holdemore Photo uh, the, uh, Directory was launch, launched in late 2020. Her research continues. Uh, she is also information manager for the Holdemore Resource Library project. Please, Lana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and also thank you to the panelists for uh, very informative papers, uh, panelists present and not present. But uh, this was very interesting. And in this panel, we are looking at oral and photo documentary history as informational blocks in themselves. Standard official archival materials look at the policies and decisions of government authorities. As Dr. Tetiana Boryak pointed out, the testimonies of witnesses report on what the consequences of those official policies are on the ground. While sometimes oral testimonies Testimonies corroborate uh, the uh, corroborate, excuse me, the official reports. More often than not, uh, in the Soviet case, they serve to fill in the information gaps. I particularly liked how uh, Natalia Kuzovova opens by saying that the life and death of a single individual is no less significant than the life and death of millions. And the challenge to oral historians is how to apply what we learn from the particular to the greater population. What I might suggest is that drawing upon the particularities of individual experiences across a large expanse is 
how we can achieve a more comprehensive yet nuanced understanding of what the population was going through at that given time. So this is only the fourth panel of the conference yet by now, beginning with the wide ranging and really fascinating keynote address, right, of uh, Dr. Hanen Kofrizen. Uh, and then on through several papers on the following panels, we can see the multiplicity of ways in which oral histories have been used to gain insight on the experience of the Holdemar. Our panelists here in discussing oral history point out that a few gaps remain in the gathering of testimonies. For example, and Natalia Kuzovova mentions that city residents have often been neglected by interviewers in Ukraine. Yet many, yet many of today's urban residents may have left the villages to seek employment or sustenance in the cities as Holodomor conditions worsen and could speak to those related experiences. I might add that in fact, a large number of what we may consider photos depicting actual conditions and consequences of the starvation were taken on the city streets of Kharkiv as secretly captured <clears throat> by Austrian Alexander Wienerberger and other photos were captured in Kiev though not yet widely known. <clears throat> this aspect of the whole the more at the intersection of rural and urban life has not been deeply explored though as Kimberly St. Julian Varnon described in her discussion of the Rachenko diaries yesterday, the oral history is available as well. Uh, Dr. Tatiana Buryak states that as many as 200,000 source, 200, sources of oral history exist today. And she goes on to say that now is the time to analyze the vast quantity of data contained within these oral history sources, to deal with the problems of disparate methods of data collection, and to solve those issues. <clears throat> Dr. Buryak's analysis then turns to some of the problems that face users and archivists of Holodom oral history. Uh, and these include a great variation, both in quality and methodology of the interviews, the questionable authenticity of some of the accounts and geographical name changes over time. Now, one of my favorite parts of uh, Ms. Kuzovova's paper is her example of utilizing a non-conventional combination of personal records and official archives that provide, as she notes, a uniquely multidimensional portrayal of what was happening in 1933, Southern Ukraine. On the one hand, there are memoirs and testimonies of people fleeing decurcalization or arrest or starvation of the whole of the Mod in, in Ukraine. They were fleeing to Crimea. Meanwhile, there are photos from private collections that show Communist Party members vacationing in Ketch in Crimea. To add to the story, there are official archival documents that describe police searching for Ukrainian Kurkuls in Crimea. Putting this all together presents a fascinating story. Now the perfect segue to the next two papers is Dr. Tintiana's Buryak regarding the urgent need for one unified centralized base for the storage and archival preservation of oral history sources about the famine. She notes that some work is being done, uh, uh, being led by the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory and some by the National Museum of Holodomor Genocide, but not in a centralized and unified way. Uh, here, I presume we're talking about physical content, the actual origin, original papers, the technical resources uh, uh, containing oral history. So I'll have to presume again that this is mostly a matter of politics and money. What Professor Hanadi Buryak initiated, the Holodomor Digital Archives, is actually a parallel consolidation of archival sources, however, one that is virtually accessible to all searchable across a multitude of formats and requiring only the space to house a core level of staff. But it too is subject to the vagaries of politics and availability of considerable funds. In my mind, both the comprehensive digital and the centralized physical Holodomor archives are necessary. What Professor Buryak presents is an exceptional archival resource. It is based in part on the premises of the original electronic Holodomor archives, which was created under his direction in the early 2000s, which was and continues in an almost dormant state, a section of the Ukrainian National Archives. 
Now in 2008, as we learned, this vast archive was moved to the web portal of the Institute of Ukrainian History and is continually updated. Uh, Professor Buryat then explored uh, alternatives that are state of the art, designed to present individual documents and visual sources in chronological and regional dimensions, which prompted the creation of a new project based on the existing collection of the materials. Uh, and that project is the whole of the more digital archives. Um, as evident from Ms. Ms. Yurkova's presentation, what is unique about this enterprise is that it will contain the digitized contents of ultimately perhaps all the regional archival sources of Ukraine as it existed in between um, 1928 and 1934. As I've explored it, I have found it very easy to use and the display is user-friendly as well. So my question to Titania Buryak would be, if the regional holdings on the Holdemar can be digitized and accessible via the Holdemar digital archives, do you think this would be adequate rather than having the local and regional archives stored in a central location? Turning to Ms. Yurkova's paper, I'm first struck by the description of the process of visiting the local museums and libraries of the Kievovas about the interpersonal dynamics involved in building relationships of trust and sense of common purpose before you can really dig in and fully explore their holdings. Uh, clearly, your team did a great job with this. Uh, secondly, a statement you made really stood out for me, that not only photos with corpses could tell the story about the Holdemar, something that you needed to repeat often as you asked to see photos from the interwar period. This is a question I have often pondered myself as I selected photos that appeared in the whole of the more photo directory, whose focus is on what we call forbidden photographs. This directory was a project that was researched and published with Anastasia Lustician and Daria Glaskova with the assistance and under the auspices of Prec Canada. Now, for example, the question might be, can this picture stand alone or does it need to be part of a larger story? Contrary to popular opinion, most pictures cannot stand alone unless one is simply hoping to generate a really very simple emotion. Given a variety of contexts, even that emotion might shift. Given background textual information, that emotion could shift yet again. Given the near pathological requirement of sequencing and silence by Soviet authorities, as Olga Bertelson discussed yesterday, photography depicts anything depicting anything near starvation or deprivation was forbidden and almost impossible to achieve. We have numerous accounts to that effect. And as Ms. Yurikova mentioned, there are at least five photographers arrested among those she learned of in her regional research. And we have the well-known arrest of Nikolai Bokan and records of casual photographers arrested in Kharkiv as well. On the other hand, there is something that I personally find wrenching which is in seeing a posed family portrait such as may have been taken by Petro Krauchenko, and then learning from local accounts or a bit of oral history, as Ms. Yurkova points out with regard to the, his photographs, that certain memories of that happy family per perish during the whole of the war. Um, so I will end on that note. Uh, I'm sure we, we would like to have a few minutes remaining for discussion. Uh, from from the audience. Thank you very much. And uh, before um, I will invite uh, our presenters to respond, I just want to remind, um, uh, please um, write your questions in the chat and I can see that there are some questions. So um, please uh, now uh, you can you can respond to Lana's Babi uh, comments. Thank you. Can I say <laughs> can I uh, say some words? First of all, I am so sorry I failed with uh, uh, both presentations. Uh, if uh, I uh, you give me the chance, I will try to scroll photos again just to <laughs> is it possible? Uh, Dr. Yurkova, we uh, we saw your presentation, but not uh, Dr. Borax. Uh, 
Professor Borek. Ah, sorry. If you can just show us quick, very quickly um, his presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, just uh, a few photos uh, from uh... mm. Is there any chance, and this would give us oh, more no. to, perhaps no. these uh, <laughs> slideshows could be uh, shared with <laughs> the link? Would that be possible? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I... Uh, you know, perhaps if it were Oksana, you could share a link. Next, uh, well, I, I can... Uh, uh, propose that uh, I will make uh, a PDF with my presentation and then uh, share it with uh, the participants of uh, this uh, uh, panel because uh, other, I, I can't uh, solve my uh, technical problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, dear Lana, uh, I uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention and for your good uh, uh, words for our project. Uh, we will uh, we will continue and we need to cooperate with uh, all projects that collect uh, these photos and uh, to continue our work uh, all together. And I think that we need to tell stories uh, on the basis of uh, photos which we collected because sometimes even one photo can tell more than photos of dead people. That, photos of uh, children, of hungry children, or uh, children uh, which gathered um, uh, uh, at the kindergartens uh, or something like that. Uh, they can uh, describe the situation much more uh, vividly than uh, dead people. Thank you. Thank you, yes, I agree. Um, I think, I think yeah. the, the visual, uh, this research that you are doing and in, in locating additional photographs and some and what we're doing from the side of HEC, uh, dealing mostly with foreign photographers, uh, is is unfortunately 90 years later, you know, pioneering work. Uh, and this to some extent is extending, you know, the kind of information that we were getting through oral histories. So it is it is very important. And uh, we have some questions uh, to Dr. Yurkova. Uh, thank you, uh, Daria Matingui. Thank you for the important work you are doing with so many local museums in uh, dire state being raided and the artifacts uh, then being sold uh, on uh, the old uh, uh, action, auction and you are saving them from uh, um, saving them. So, um, um, I saw something, okay. Um, ha, uh, Daria asking, have you had a chance uh, to look at the archives of district newspaper on national like Radyansky Solo? They had uh, photo reporters and their materials might have survived at least in part on, in the family archive. First question to Dr. Uh, Yurkova. Uh, excuse me. Daria asked uh, about Radyansky Sol. Yes, uh, or um, district newspapers. Uh, no, uh, to the, I will answer Daria. Yes, about district. Uh, you know that uh, we collected more than one thousand photos in museums and. Uh, we uh, scanned uh, photos from two sides, from uh, the front and the back side. And now we are working on uh, uh, putting these uh, photos uh, in the database and it's great work. Uh, it uh, demands a lot of time. And uh, unfortunately, up to now, I get acquainted only with Obuhiv local newspapers, not with uh, uh, Radyansky Selo and uh, other central uh, newspapers uh, which are devoted and do not look through uh, 
their their photos but it's necessary it, it's necessary to do and to combine uh, our photos and uh, photos from newspapers uh, and uh, i think that it will be next great very great step uh, to collect uh, all these photos in white database thank you for your question um uh, also have a question from uh, Professor Sarban and this whole discussion in the, in the chat. Um, Professor Sarban asks, in addition to information on collectivization and the whole the more, are there any mentions of uh, discussion in the documents you uh, analyze about schooling of the children? Any hint at what is uh, described by uh, fifth act of uh, genocide dis uh, destruction? Um, forcibly transferring uh, children of the group to another group. And Professor Serban refers to, uh, to the history of uh, communist China, as example, and um, the, he uh, believes that Chinese policies uh, towards its minorities is an imitation of Stalin's genocide of the Ukrainian population of the USSR. So um, please... Uh, Трохи відповідали вже пану Сербину в особисті повідомлення. Так, ця проблема, вона відображена у спогадах, і в першу чергу це пов'язано із спогадами дітей, які були заслані разом із своїми родинами за опір хлібозаготіві. Це було у січні 1933 року. Такі діти, вони виймалися із своєї етнічної, національної групи і були переселені е, на північ. Якщо батьки їхні гинули, то вони втрачали свою ідентичність. Якщо в них не було можливості повернутися, якщо їх заставала війна, такі спогади ми зустрічаємо, то вони втрачають навички володіння українською мовою, і навіть якщо вже повернулися, це одразу видно по мові спогадів, вона російська. І ось я наводила е, приклад записаного спогаду, як людина, чому вона народилася в Україні, чому вона розмовляє російською мовою, а людина з молодих літ служила в армії. Це також е, один із інструментів втрати ідентичності. Щодо другого питання, яке задавав пан Сербин, школа, радянська школа як е, геноцидна практика. Тут е, в спогадах дуже важко це відслідкувати, тому що людина вона має сама усвідомити, що її навчають рідною мовою, але навчають чомусь не тому. Адже людина не сприймає себе якось на тлі подій, посередині якоїсь там лінії часу, вона сприймає своє життя цілісним, їй дуже важко виділяти такі моменти. І такі люди, вони говорять, що так, я пережив голодомор, так, я пережив розкорпулення, і водночас десь в кінці розповіді вони висловлюють жаль за Радянським Союзом. Ну, такі в них рефлексії виникають. Ну, це дуже важко, саме в спогадах, в документах це можна виділити, тобто документи це підтверджують, але в спогадах це... Ну, Трохи важко для людини це усвідомити, що з нею зробили щось не так. Але це не стосується дітей розкуркулених. Вони е, зберігають, якщо е, хтось залишається із родини, вони чітко ідентифікують, де їхні вироби. Дякую. Дякую. Question about Turksings and photo of Turksings. Can I answer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a, photo, uh, a question about uh, Turksin photos. Yes, uh, we met uh, twice uh, such kind of photos uh, in uh, small villages, and it was rather unexpected because. Uh, uh, they were made in 1934 uh, 35 uh, and they were uh, annotated as uh, photos of uh, village sh shops uh, in the villages but uh, 
according to their views, according to their uh, objects on these photos, we can definitely say that uh, we can see the photos of Traxins in put uh, please wait uh, a little bit we will put all our uh, findings uh, online in open access um, thank you i would like to provide a, a brief reply if i may uh, <clears throat> so um uh, 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 regarding the, the issue of uh, centralized uh, repository, I would like to remind, I, I forgot to, to, to say in my presentation uh, about um, uh, uh, such aspect as, as policy that, uh, uh, I mean, politics uh, that unfortunately influence uh, the our history today in Ukraine and the Holodomor in particular. Uh, if you uh, recall time of uh, the president Viktor Yanukovych, uh, when um, um, we have, uh, well, we noticed uh, uh, how documents were uh, taken off uh, from the web pages of administrations, of archives, of SBU. Security Service of Ukraine. So I think that creation of uh, one unified uh, centralized digital uh, uh, repository is is very important. Uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, at first, we have to uh, at least to understand how many sources we have. <clears throat> As I mentioned, to, we have them in the archives, in, in local museums, uh, like Pani Aksana Yurkova mentioned, in, in, even in schools. And, you know, in many cases, the originals uh, have been lost. So at least we have a chance to save uh, at least part of, uh, of testimonies that are preserved in places, in many places that are not uh, suitable for archival uh, for for preservation of, of the archives. So I think the first step would be to make a list of uh, these places to evaluate the amount of uh, oral history and, and many oral, oral history uh, sources had been published. So it's not difficult to take uh, a book to make a, a, PDF, a PDF copy of uh, a PDF file uh, of oral history sources and uh, and to present them, to collect final information from all archives, if, if they agree to make copies, it, it, it's not difficult. But, uh, you know, it, it, in terms of, uh, of preservation of the, these poor documents, uh, many of them uh, had been lost. I think it, uh, it is important to do this uh, somehow. And we have National Institute of National Memory that could be part of, of this project, for instance. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I, I don't see um, any other questions in the chat. So I mean, it's um, time to, to end our panel. So I just want to remind that next panel starts at 1230 Eastern Starland uh, time. And the title of the panel is uh, National Minorities During the Holodomor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, presenters and uh, discussants. Uh, very interesting panel. And um, uh, I hope to see you uh, soon online. Thank you. Thank you.